Well, good morning, Timbers, family and friends. I am glad you are able to join us today and I hope you are well and enjoying our springtime here in Prince George. I counted an honor to be able uh, to share with you today. Over a month ago, I woke up in the middle of the night with thoughts about our church timbers and the need to continue to reach out to our community. And I got thinking about a lot of things and some, tr some trouble getting back to sleep. Well, later that morning, I received a call from Pastor Andrew and asking me if I would preach a sermon regarding the core values of Timber Community Church that had been prepared as part of a long process to establish a vision statement and a mission statement. It just seemed way too much of a coincidence that these things came to mind in my sleep the night before, so how could I decline? As mentioned, Timbers has come through a long process to establish its purpose for being. Statements on vision, values, and mission. I especially appreciate the process that was undertaken. I thank Pastor Andrew for his leadership in bringing people from leadership and the Congregation of Timbers to examine the strengths and opportunities there that are the fabric of Timbers. I know that much time has, uh, was taken to get the wording just right in each of the statements, and this is a good thing. It's important that everybody can easily understand the intent and meaning of what is stated, but also words can be inspiring. I particularly like the vision statement, the four A's as I like to call it, alive, alert, avid, and active. Our vision is to be a people alive with the presence of the Holy Spirit, alert to the compassion and love of God, avid followers of the word and active in living and sharing Jesus with others. Interestingly, the vision closely aligns with the values, which are generally as follows. At Timbers, we value being a community of grace, transformed by the word of God, reliant on the Holy Spirit and sent to proclaim Jesus. I think that being a community of grace definitely lines up with alert to the compassion and love of God, part of the vision uh, statement that being transformed by the word of God would make us avid followers of the word, that being reliant on the Holy Spirit is definitely about being alive in the presence of the Holy Spirit, and that being sent to proclaim Jesus fulfills the vision of being active in living and sharing Jesus with others. Over the past three weeks, we've heard from Cliff, Kay, and Rianne as they have shared the first three core values. Today, I will be sharing the fourth core value, sent to proclaim Jesus. And under this value, four commitments are stated, which are, as a people sent to proclaim Jesus, we will love our neighbors near and far, know and share the gospel, practice Christ-like generosity, create and be alert to opportunities for people to encounter Jesus. And finally, we have the mission statement, which is the action plan, summed up in one sentence. Our mission is to serve our community in love, grace, and truth, so that others may become disciples of Jesus Christ. My talk today will explore what Jesus expected of his disciples, those that were with him during the period of his ministry, right from the beginning, what Jesus provided for them to fulfill the mission or commission, the great commission that he stated before he ascended into heaven, and to reflect on the identity of Timbers Community Church in the community and our opportunities to fulfill the mission of others becoming disciples of Jesus. Though I will be drawing from many scriptures today, we will start off with my choice of four passages that I believe help serve as an overview of today's message. As we continue with it, that has become a practice during our services at Timbers, and that is to stand during the reading of God's words, I ask that if you please stand with me as we begin by reading from the Gospel of John 15, 1 through 8. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, 
you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burn. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear fruit, much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. And then further on, same chapter, John 15, 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. And further on in John 15, 26 to 27, we read, When the counselor comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify, testify about me. You also must testify. For you have been with me from the beginning. And then over to Matthew 28, 16 to 20. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you today for your word. We thank you for this wonderful passage that talks about so much. We're going to explore and dig into it. And I just pray today that you give us the understanding and help us to receive from you. In Jesus' name. So we read in John 15 that Jesus is the vine. His disciples are the branches. The branches are pruned so that they may bear fruit. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. That is in Jesus. But what is fruit? Well, it's obviously a metaphor. Disciples don't actually grow fruit. Though fruit is not explained specifically in this passage, we learn that it's something desirable to God the Father. Verse 8, it says, this is my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. We can get better understanding of what a fruit is from what Paul the Apostle wrote in Galatians 5 and 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The fruit is all of these positive attributes that are on display to individuals with whom Jesus' disciples come into contact. Also, we read in verse 2 that the Father will prune branches that do bear fruit so that they will bear even more fruit. One may presume that as disciples grow in the vine in Jesus, there's still the occasional bad limb that will sprout out. Perhaps these would be negative attributes such as selfishness, complacency, idleness, busyness, prejudice, or worse. Things that would interfere with the growth of fruit. But why call these attributes of a disciple fruit? I wonder, uh, as I read. Um, well, they are physical manifestations of a transformed Christian life. Uh, the Greek word karpos, that we translate fruit, usually means fruit in the sense of edible fruits and vegetables. But it can also be translated as offspring, deed, action, result, or profit. In agricultural society, fruit is a good thing, is a result of hard work, careful tending. Today, we might use the word fruit in a phrase such as the fruit of our labor to communicate the results of our effort. Even if we don't harvest strawberries or apples, we can have fruit, something to show for our work in a paycheck, a finished project, or even a baby. Understanding that fruit is this verse Understanding of fruit in this verse can mean deed, action, or result helps make this verse more personal. The result of the work of the Holy Spirit in a believer's life is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. But I would like to introduce an idea here that maybe is hidden pearl for what Jesus was equipping his disciples into action. What do we find in a fruit, such as an apple, an orange, a grape, cantaloupe, or whatever? Seeds. The fruit is a reproductive part of the vine, or perhaps the cone of the tree, 
a timber, if you will. <laughs> I believe that as disciples remain on the vine in Jesus, the fruit that grows provides for his disciples an avenue to display these attributes or fruit, love, joy, peace, kindness, etc. in relationships that are developed with others in the community, relationships that will provide a means to sow the seed. When disciples of Jesus have opportunity to get to know people what, through whatever means, places of employment, volunteer organizations, art class, music lessons, kids soccer or hockey, exercise classes, rock climbing, etc., and their fruit is on display, the seed can be planted. As disciples, may we recognize and be on the lookout for those opportunities. But there's more. Growing fruit and equipping his disciples with seeds is not all that Jesus provided to achieve his divine purpose. Later on in John 15, 26 and 27, Jesus promised that when the counselor comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth, he will testify about me. And you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. The disciples at this point must have been a bit bewildered uh, what this meant, as this was before Jesus was arrested, put on trial, condemned to death, crucified, raised from the dead, and then ascended into heaven. For context, this, this uh, talk Jesus was giving was the Last Supper. It was the, the four, ver four chapters of John where Jesus was intimately sharing with his 12, the 12 that had been through his ministry. The, the, I, as, as we say, as this was before he was arrested, the disciples could never imagine how this would be able to continue their leader's ministry. But after Jesus was crucified, rose from the dead, and then appeared to the disciples, we, we also read in Luke 24, verses 45 to 49, that he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer, rise from the dead and on the third day. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, and I am going to send you what my father has promised. But stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. And again, in the book of Acts, just before Jesus ascended into heaven, Acts 1, 4, 5. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem. But wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And what happened after the Holy Spirit descended on the day of Pentecost? Well, we read in Acts 2 that Peter, Peter, this one that had been impetuous type of person that would kind of jump at things. And, and then in the end, even after Speaking with Jesus, he said, I would never leave you, Lord. He denied him three times. This Peter stood up and preached to the crowd of Jews that were staying in Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost. And filled with the Holy Spirit, he said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. I think he was testifying as Jesus had wanted him to, had wanted to instructed his disciples in, in the, at the Last Supper there. The result of this powerful message was, as we read in, in verse 41, those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. A number of years ago, Charles Price, who was uh, then the lead pastor for the People's Church in Toronto, was touring through Western Canada and came to Prince George. Uh, Timbers hosted the event on behalf of the Prince George Ministerial Association, and I remember attending the event at the Playhouse on a Sunday evening. It was packed, and it was really uh, quite an, uh, an evening. I remember now very little about the actual message, except for one thing that Charles Price said. He said that when Jesus ascended into heaven and the Holy Spirit was sent, the disciples ceased to be followers of Jesus. What? Well, what happened is that they became Christian disciples. The Spirit indwelled them. I like to think it as Christ in disciples, like Christ hyphen in. So instead of being followers, Christ was now, or the Holy Spirit now indwelled these disciples. And, and, and this is a difference in just merely following good, good teachings. 
which many religions today is it's about. The difference with Jesus is that he's equipped us and he, his father has sent the Holy Spirit to indwell us. So then in review, we see that as Jesus' disciples abide in the vine, that is in Jesus, they will bear fruit, which being on display in the community near and far becomes or an opportunity to sow the seeds of the gospel. Further, Jesus promised that the Holy Spirit be sent to empower his disciples to testify about him. Now, the next thought is about Jesus' disciples. The group of 12 that were with him during his three-year ministry, which of course became 11 after Judas betrayed him, uh, we see here that Jesus had a plan and a purpose for this group right from the beginning. In John 15, 16, he says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so that whatever you ask in my name, the father will give you. So let's go back. Let's journey back to the beginning of Jesus ministry when he chose his disciples, his team. That not only would he, uh, they be taught and grow fruit, but would be assigned to a purpose to testify about him. My Zondervan's Thaide Bible provides this insight. Uh, disciples normally choose the particular rabbi to whom they wanted to be attached, but it was not so with Jesus' disciples. He chose them and for a purpose. We will now look at some different passages in the Gospels that provide us with an understanding of the men and, and what Jesus chose. We're going to look at the calling of the disciples. Matthew 4, uh, 18 to 22. One day, Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee. There, there he saw two brothers, Simon Peter and his brother Andrew. They were throwing a net into the lake because they were fishermen. Hey, come and follow me, Jesus says. I will send you out to fish for people. At once, they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers. They were James, and son of, uh, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father, Zebedee. And as they were preparing their nets, Jesus called out to them. Right away, they left the boat and their father, and John followed Jesus. What I find interesting is how immediate this response was for these four men. If the usual practice was for disciples to choose the rabbi they wished to study under, under how come these men were so compelled to follow Jesus in the spot. Well, I think there's more to it. And we look at what's with Luke 5, 1 to 11. Again, I'm reading a lot of scripture here, but hopefully uh, this helps in, in this. Uh, point here. One day Jesus was standing by the Sea of Galilee. People crowded around him and listened to the word of God. Jesus saw two boats on the edge of the water. They had been left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into the boat that belonged to Simon. Jesus asked him to go out a little way from the shore. Then he sat down in the boat and taught the people. When he finished speaking, he turned to Simon. Jesus said, go out into deep water. Let down the nets so you can catch some fish. And Simon answered, Master, we worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught a large number of fish. There were so many that the nets began to break. They motioned to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. They came and filled their boats so full they began to sink. And when Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees. Go away from me, Lord. He said, I am a sinful man. He and everyone with him were amazed at the number of fish they'd caught. So were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who worked with Simon. Then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on the shore. They left everything and followed him. Okay, so we now see that Jesus was being followed by a crowd who were there to hear him speak. He seconded a fishing boat to allow him to teach the people. The boat happened to belong to Simon Peter. Simon not only heard him speak, but after he finished speaking, he told Simon to go and drop a net to catch some fish. And though Simon scoffed, he went out anyway and was amazed at the huge amount of fish that he began to even break their nets. He was witnessing a miracle and he knew there was something very special about this Jesus. And Jesus said, from now on, you will fish for men or people, depending on your translation. I would think these disciples who followed Jesus received a lot more than they bargained for. Jesus was calling them right from the start to spread the message about who he was and 
that who that he would be fishers of men. Jesus' purpose was that that all would come to know the Father through the sacrifice that he would make on the cross to save the world from sin. That through his resurrection, believers in him would have eternal life. And that more than these things, people would be transformed into, into disciples that would have a relationship with him. So more than what the average rabbi might treat a disciple, Jesus was equipping these particular group this particular group to carry on past his his death and his his resurrection and his ascension so today we've explored an underlying message in john 15 growing and bearing fruit to provide opportunity to plant the seed of the gospel the receiving the filling and the empowering of the holy spirit to testify about jesus and being chosen to carry out and fulfill uh, great commission that Jesus said before uh, to, to go and make disciples of all nations. Sent to proclaim Jesus, as stated in Timber's core values, active in living and sharing Jesus with others, as stated in the vision, and to serve our community in love, grace, and truth so that others may become disciples of Jesus Christ, which is our mission statement in Timber's. It's our commitment to this message in John 15, and that it is also inherent, I believe, in what Timbers has always been, our DNA, if you will. So now I'm just going to depart a little bit from the word and, and share my view, my perspective, perhaps, of, of, of the Timbers DNA, and what Timbers has been and, and is unique in its uh, service to the community of Prince Church. Um, a few years ago, Timbers was looking to find a new place for ministry. And we had well over 300 people attending. We had recently started to hold two services on Sunday mornings, and we had a healthy annual budget. For many reasons, it seemed like the time to make a move and financial commitment to build or to acquire property where we could have a permanent location for ministry. But something came to me at that time, and I wondered about this. And bear with me as I say this. Is Timbers to become another aquarium on a speaker? What do you mean aquarium? Well, the image for me was that aquariums are safe places for fish. And there are often lots of diversity in aquariums. You know, you got your angel fish, you got, you know, black mollies, and you've got some guppies and... Uh, Maybe a few, maybe a piranha that you don't want to have around, but 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 you 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 get the picture that it's a safe place for fish, and and it's a good place. It's a place where the fish can grow, and and uh, walls are clear. We hope. Sadly, in some cases, very little is exposed to the community surrounding them. A believer, a family of a family of believers may move to Prince George, and they will have their choice of which aquarium best suits them. But how often will a non-believing fish enter an aquarium? Um, well, aquariums, that is the church buildings, are the usually, usually the objective or goal for a new church plant. And, and the other thing, why I speak? Well, the reason why is that several churches are already there. Take your pick. You've got Pentecostal Tab, you've got Lakewood Alliance, you've got Salvation Army, you've got the Canadian Reform, you've got the Westwood it goes on and on and even a block away or two you might have more churches it seems that that neighborhood was something that was well served by by churches um but also why it came to mind is as someone that has worked for the city i know that at the end of a speak in your tiner there's a vacant lands and and those may be an opportunity there may be an opportunity to work with a developer or owner of those lands to get a piece of property to build a timbers aquarium if you will uh, and and have a more permanent place and prominent location so that was going this is what going through my head okay so just just so I'm clear that's not something that I did I've had shared this with some people but this is what what was going through my mind a number of years ago now um, let's just go back to the beginning of timbers so I was on the board of Lakewood Alliance Church a Christian missionary Alliance Church 
And we decided, there's a lot of circumstances I won't get into, not in interest of time today, but it was a, decided to plant a daughter church. It was determined that that church should be located in the College Heights area. Now this was the mid nineties. Um, there, there was a, a lot of activity and growth, a lot of new development going on. And again, practically speaking, it's hard to find an existing piece of property. So if the land is developing, you can maybe work with an owner and or developer and get a piece of land that's big enough for what your needs are for a church because they don't plan to put churches. They, they, they give them a general uh, zoning. And so uh, the zoning could be anything from like a daycare or school maybe or other things. So, um, so anyway, just saying that that's what we had at Lakewood and what we thought would become the location. Now, pastor uh, Ian Bennett was retained to become the pastor of the new church plant. Uh, and that happened 24 years ago, 20, yeah, 1997. And I think we're like 24 years now. Uh, which became, this new church plant became Timbers Community Church, of course. And, and flyers were distributed in College Heights. I remember I walked through the, a lot of the neighborhoods of College Heights to find handle those, those flyers. And Pastor Ian's family even rented a house in College Heights. I think later bought a house. Uh, cool Cats Daycare, I think in Gladstone Boulevard, was the first location that Timbers operated from for its Sunday meetings. But then the Playhouse became available. Sunday services moved there. But the church office ended up being at Pastor Ian's home. And for many years, that's how it was operated. But, um, but the interesting thing is that this sort of moving around a lot, during those early years, many people that came to Timbers, a lot of them were people that maybe had quit attending church earlier in their lives and renewed their faith at Timbers, or where there were brand new believers. Well, eventually a storefront building was purchased on Third Avenue to serve as an office and to hold small midweek meetings. And of course that's become the hub, which we still have today. And we have purchased it, of course. Um, and then 2008, I believe it was, uh, Pastor Ian had to step down due to health reasons in about that time. And, and, and then a period of time, after a period of time, uh, Paul Bert Teague became our lead pastors. Well, Timbers experienced significant growth over those next several years. It was a happening place in many respects. Sunday mornings were full of great worship, leading with an incredible musicians. In fact, a recording artist, and Stephen Toon, was, was an incredible person and attracted a lot of musicians, per se, and lots of video, lots of jokes, good speaking. Dare I say, it was an entertaining time to come to a service at the Playhouse this timbers uh, but the growth that we received during that time many of those attending had come from other aquariums <laughs> in the city and it's not a bad thing uh, people may want to move but that was the growth that was most of the growth now there was many people that still but not the same as what we might have had in the earlier days um, well, four years ago uh, and, and just to say that the other thing that that I remember, because I came on the board in 2015, and uh, I won't get into my time with Timbers, but um, initially we did not attend Timbers, my wife and I. We stayed with Lakewood, went to another church for a while, and that closed down. And in 2012, we said, hey, we're going to go back to Timbers, and that's where we've been since. And 2015, I came on the board, and and uh, and we found that it was really difficult to get people to do stuff. Going to the playoffs on a Sunday morning was pretty good. People could come and go and get entertained, or let's dare I say, and not really make a commitment. Maybe they'd made all kinds of commitments in the aquarium that they'd been from, and now they could just kind of come, get, you know, get their fix for the week. That's, again, I'm sharing my view of this, and I don't want to insult or hurt anybody, but I remember the difficulty in getting people to serve and, and work at that time. Something disciples might need to be doing, right? I'll just share this. My wife and I, Grace, we live in Nest Lake. And we volunteered to lead a Bible study. And it was, you know, a great Bible study. My wife put it together. She's really awesome. 
and we said, well, let's get a place in the heart area so that people could come to. <laughs> and so people signed up and we found a place. So the people that we found, we were not part of Timbers. Uh, we got to know them really well and they were very wonderful folks. But you know what? We had Bible study for three months with four of us. Grace, me, and these two folks. Not one person from that had signed up from Timbers committed and followed, like committed, I guess, but didn't follow through. This this bothered me a lot because what are we saying? Are people just kind of coming for the fun on a Sunday and not really wanting to really commit to the Lord? So these were symptoms that were there. And of course, I won't get into that too much, but well, four years ago, Timbers and Dirt split and we find the father did some pruning in our midst and perhaps even a few branches were cut out of. So this, all to say this, so if Timbers is not an aquarium, what is it? Well, it came to me not long ago that Timbers is operated as a fishing boat. And we have found ourselves on the sea looking to cast the net, as Jesus said to his disciples, fishers of people or men, whichever translation you prefer. Look at a fishing boat. A man, you know, think of Jesus on goat on the water with sleeping in the boat with his disciples and the storm coming up and everybody. I mean, fishing boat on the, on the sea can be a pretty scary thing. And we're kind of vulnerable to stuff. And that's kind of what I thought, you know, like, you know, maybe lots of people do still come from aquariums and will join the, the boat, if you will. But they will know that there's work to do and that they will have the purpose in mind. And now with our um, commitment here, um, we are looking in our vision statement and our mission and our values to send, um, proclaim the gospel and, um, and to um, proclaim Jesus. Amen. So I would like to conclude with uh, another scripture verse that I believe is another one, but some, I believe it sums up our core values at, at Timbers Community Church in a way. And it's kind of like to me a pep talk, a coach might give to a team as they step out onto the playing field or a court or ice rink. I like the living trans, uh, living Bible translation for this passage. It's in Ephesians 3, 14 to 21. And I think of the wisdom and scope of his plan. I fall down on my knees and pray to the father of all the great family of God. Some of them are already in heaven and some down here on earth. That out of his glorious unlimiting resources, he will give you the mighty inner strengthening of his Holy Spirit. And I pray that Christ will be more and more at home in your hearts, living within you as you trust in him. May your roots grow down deep into the soil, God's marvelous love. And why, and may you be able to feel and understand as all God's children should, how long, how wide, how deep, and how high his love really is. And to experience this love for yourselves, though it is so great that you will never see the end of it or fully know or understand it. And so at, the la so at last you will be filled with God himself. Now glory be to God who at, by his mighty power at work within us is able to do far more than we would ever dare to ask or even dream of. Infinitely beyond our highest prayers, desires, thoughts, or hopes. May he be given glory forever and ever through endless ages because of his master plan of salvation for the church through Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord, I just prayed today that you will help us proclaim Jesus. That right from the start, you want your disciples to share, to testify about you. You've equipped us, Lord. The process of us growing off in the vine, which you, which you are, and, and as we grow, we have opportunities, seeds, if you will, to, 
to plant. We also have the Holy Spirit who's there for us and, and empowering people. In some cases, people that have maybe a gift, but we are all disciples and we all have this requirement, Lord, to be part of your kingdom and in looking to those that need to know you. Help may through your Holy Spirit, we will recognize those opportunities to share. In Jesus' name, amen.